Hello and welcome to 7 Days of Science, your weekly source for the latest science news. In the headlines this week, the world's oldest known seropodon dinosaur has been found, a new kind of dinosaur has been named from southern France, physicists present a quantum theory of gravity, and much more. Our top story this week is that the world's oldest known seropodon dinosaur has just been discovered in middle Jurassic aged rocks in Morocco. Seropoda is the name given to the grouping that includes all the ceratopsians, or horned dinosaurs, plus the pachycephalosaurs and the ornithopods, so things such as the hadrosaurs, iguanodontids and various other lineages. This is a significant group of dinosaurs. Seropodons are well known from fossils during the Cretaceous period, but their origins likely trace back to the older Jurassic period. They were thought to have evolved by the Middle Jurassic before achieving global distribution in the Cretaceous. But until now, the only evidence of their presence in the Middle Jurassic included a single bone from the UK and footprints that appear to have been made by these animals. However, this new study now reports a fragment of a femur, the upper leg bone, from one of these dinosaurs discovered in the Atlas Mountains of Morocco, which exhibits characteristic features of the group. The head of the femur is offset from the shaft on a distinct neck, and there is a notable constriction at one point, all pointing to this originating from an ancient seropodon. This further supports the notion that the Middle Jurassic was an especially important time in dinosaur evolution, as this major lineage became established in terrestrial ecosystems, beginning their radiation to occupy various herbivore niches. The particular mid-Jurassic aged formation in Morocco from which this fragment came from was also the site where the world's oldest ankylosaur was discovered, the species Spicomelus, named in 2021. Additionally, it's where one of the oldest stegosaurs was found, Adreticlet, named in 2020. Clearly, this is a highly significant formation, and the study states that further exploration of this geological formation will be crucial for enhancing our understanding of these remarkable dinosaur groups. Also in the paleontology news this week, a new type of dinosaur has been named. It's called Obelignathus septimanicus, named for the character Obelix in the French comic book series Asterix, a character known for his exceptional strength, since this dinosaur had a very robust and strong looking jaw. It lived about 72 million years ago, and the animal belongs to a grouping of dinosaurs called the Rhabdodontomorphs, an interesting group of small to large herbivores. The classification of these animals has long been debated among paleontologists. And so this new study set out to resolve some of these issues by analysing the anatomy of jawbones from various rhabdodontomorph species, since these bones are pretty well preserved in most fossils of these dinosaurs. They discovered that a species called Rhabdodon septimanicus, named in 1991 based on a robust lower jawbone found in southern France, was particularly distinct from all other European rhabdodontomorphs. As such, they've now elevated it from being included within the already established Rhabdodon genus, and distinguished it as its own thing, Obelignathus septimanicus. So this particularly robust jawed plant eater shows that the rhabdodontomorphs were even more diverse than previously expected, and since it coexisted with other rhabdodontomorphs, they were presumably also specialised to feed on different food sources, to avoid competing with one another. What a fantastic new find! Up next in the Paleo News, a new study has investigated fossil trackways made by prehistoric flying reptiles, the pterosaurs. This research has found a way to match different track types to their makers, establishing the distinct shapes of footprints created by three major groups of pterosaurs, the Tenochasmatoids, Sungaripterids, and the Neoagedarchians. By documenting these track types over time and across continents, the paleontologists significantly expanded the known geographical distributions of these groups, while also demonstrating how pterosaur lineages evolved to become more terrestrial. The late Triassic to early Jurassic lacks any tracks made by pterosaurs, and it is only from the mid-Jurassic onwards that they appear in the fossil record. This makes sense though, considering that the oldest pterosaurs are thought to have mainly been climbers, living in trees and on rock faces when not in the air, with only the later groups in the Jurassic and Cretaceous being better suited to walking on the ground. The tracks also provided new insight into the lifestyles of these three major pterosaur lineages by revealing the types of habitats in which they lived. An incredible new study demonstrating just how useful fossil footprints are. We've got some pretty interesting physics news up next as a paper has been published in the journal Reports on Progress in Physics that could be an important step in solving one of the biggest problems we have 
with our current understanding of physics. Gravity is quite a mystery in how it works. General relativity tells us a lot about gravity and what it does, but general relativity is, currently, incompatible with quantum field theory. Scientists have long thought to reconcile these theories, and the authors of this paper think they have done so with something they call the space-time dimension field. They've essentially created a quantum field theory for gravity that allows it to work with the standard model, something that scientists have previously been unable to do. Now, before you jump out of your seats to celebrate, this isn't the end, and there would still need to be a lot of work done on this proposed theory before it would be considered part of our knowledge of physics. This could take many years, so we'll have to be patient to find out whether or not this one holds up. In other, rather different news, a paper published in the journal Cell has identified various properties of a US man's blood that they say leads to an unparalleled antivenom. The man in question is Tim Freed, and he purposely allowed snakes to bite him more than 200 times, and has injected himself with snake venom over 700 times. All this was done with the intention of building his own immunity to snake venom when handling them. Meanwhile, a team of researchers was looking for someone who had developed what's called broadly neutralizing antibodies. Those are antibodies that are capable of targeting entire classes of toxin by targeting the parts of the toxins that are less unique. Naturally, they were keen to have a look at Tim Freed's blood and did indeed find that two broadly neutralizing antibodies of his could be used in an antivenom that could protect against a range of elapid snakes, which mostly use a neurotoxin in their venom to paralyze and kill their prey. This research is key for not only understanding these snakes and venoms, but also in helping researchers branch out and develop antivenoms to use for all kinds of snake bites, potentially saving a great many lives. And finally for the news this week, scientists have looked at how the loss of sea ice at the poles is altering the light conditions for the tiny plants that grow beneath the ice. These microscopic plants, called phytoplankton, form the base of food webs. By performing photosynthesis, they utilize light energy to produce their own food in the form of glucose. Depending on their location, these plants possess specific photosynthetic pigments that capture the available light energy. Research has shown that the light accessible to phytoplankton living under ice differs from that available to those living in ice-free water. The surface of sea ice strongly scatters light and reflects much of it, only allowing a small amount to penetrate, but this light still encompasses almost the full range of visible wavelengths. In contrast, open ocean water absorbs light, selectively filtering out the longer wavelengths, that's orange, red, and infrared, while retaining the shorter wavelengths, violet and blue, which is why ocean water appears blue. The photosynthetic pigments of algae living beneath sea ice are adapted to make optimal use of the wide spectrum of colors present in the limited light that filters through the ice and snow. When the ice melts, the algal species living there then find themselves in a blue-dominated environment. Algal species specialized in blue light may gain a significant competitive advantage over ice algae. This could have cascading ecological effects, as shifts in the productivity or species composition of photosynthetic algae could ripple upwards to affect fish, seabirds, and marine mammals. A very important study demonstrating the significance of sea ice for all of life on Earth. Well, that's it for the news this week. I really hope you enjoyed learning about everything that's happened in these last seven days of science. You can follow 7 Days of Science on Instagram and TikTok, and also be sure to support us on Patreon if you enjoy what we do here. As always, a big thank you to our patrons, including Andrew Kawam, Chippy Chippy Chapa Chapa, Clara Middleton, Dean A. Bather, Diana Hernandez, Drof Srivastava, Gabriella, Gary Arrington, Giotist, I Rage, John French, Joseph Marie, Corey Peterson, Lena Rose, Matt Grandis, Mendicant Fryer, Mike Pace, Monitor Man, Ralph Balzac, Robert Priyaprajika Jr., Robert Thomas, Sammy Voss, Schlom, Staniforth Hopkins, Steve Bradshaw, Thomas F. Conroy III, Timothy N. Tedrow, and Troy Schmidt. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week.